This presentation is on Orff shell work, presented by Elon Bokeland. Karl Orff was a composer best known for his cantata Carmina Burana. He was born in Munich and served in the German army during World War I, where he was severely injured and almost killed when a trench caved in. Some of his first musical works were published at age 16. These were songs, often settings of German poetry. These pieces would soon become some of Orff's distinctive musical language. In 1924, Dorothy Gunther and Orff founded the Gunther School for Gymnastics, Music, and Dance in Munich. Orff was head of the department from 1925 until the end of his life, and he worked with musical beginners. This is where he developed his theories for music education. He was motivated to come up with a curriculum because he was working with students every day. In 1930, he published a manual entitled Schulwerk, in which he originally shared his method of conducting. The pieces in this book are collectively called Music for Kidder, and most of the pieces in this book were written by Gunild Keatman. The pieces in this book are not necessarily for children to play as they are very difficult. They are to be used as examples that show the use of ostinato, borden, and appropriate texts for children. The Orff approach offers potential for active and creative mu music making to all students, not just the musically talented. Active music making is the core of this philosophy. The elemental structure of Orff can be defined in this quote from Orff himself. What is elemental? The Latin term elementarius means belonging to the elements, to the origins, the beginnings, appropriate to first principles. Further, what is elemental music? It is never music alone. It is bound together with movement, dance, and speech. It is a music that one must make himself, into which one is drawn, in not as a listener, but as a participant. It is unsophisticated, knows no large forms or grand structures. Instead, it consists of small series forms, ostinatos, and small rondo forms. Elemental music is near the earth, natural, physical, to be learned and experienced by everyone, suitable to the child. The key components of ORF are movement, singing, playing, and improvisation. Movement is where active music making comes into play. The movements are simple and they help children learn spatial awareness between themselves and others. Singing includes simple little songs, often with accompanying games, that provide a basis for strengthening the ability to sing and developing the sense of tonal relationships. Playing involves body percussion, unpitched hand percussion, and ORF instruments. Body percussion uses four basic sound motions or gestures. They are clapping, snapping fingers, slapping thighs, and stamping feet. The unpitched hand percussion uses small instruments like maracas, claves, tone blocks, triangle, jingles, finger cymbals, suspended cymbal, tambourine, cowbell, and various sizes of hand drums. Orf instruments are small and accessible for children. There are three sizes of xylophones and metallophones, soprano, alto, and bass, two sizes of glockenspiel, soprano and alto, and contrabass bars. All bars on the instruments are diatonic, starting with C, and ascending upward one octave, plus a sixth. The bars are removable, and instruments come with F-sharp and B-flat bars that can be exchanged for F and B. Chromatic instruments are also available, but are needed only in very advanced applications. The recorder is sometimes added as a contrasting melody instrument to this percussion ensemble. Pitched percussion instruments, or pitched instruments provide a means for tonal exploration, for playing and inventing melodies, for providing songs with drone and ostinato accomplishments, and for improvisation. Improvisation brings out the creative music-making part of the curriculum. Students are encouraged to make up new patterns and longer structures based on exploration and the models learned through imitation from the teacher. The rhythmic sequences are drawn from child's native languages. The melodic sequence begins with the falling minor third, proceeds to the childhood chant pattern, sol mi la sol mi, then expands to the pentatonic scales, and then finally to the diatonic scales, including major, minor, and church modes. Students are assessed on attitude, cooperation, creativity, and participation not on their musical abilities. 
Practical application for ORF would probably be in a general music classroom with younger students. Since this approach focuses on creativity and creating, students would probably be more likely to buy into this at a younger age. Some pros to the orf Schulbert curriculum are Students don't need any musical experience to begin. Movements and songs are easy to learn. Activities are fun and creative for kids. Students are learning spatial awareness, helping them develop their local motor skills. This approach forces kids to be active, which is a problem in today's society. And ORF begins exposing students to music at a very young age in an easy way. Some cons to the orf Schulwer curriculum are the curriculum is difficult to assess, the equipment is very expensive, it requires a lot of space for movement, and lessons require a lot of planning on the teacher's part. This concludes the orf Schulwerk presentation, and now for Kodai. Moving on to Zoltan Kodai and his theory, this is Alex Hunt. Starting with some background information, Kodai was born in 1882, he is Hungarian, and he is a man who wears many hats. So growing up, as he expanded his horizons, Kodai became a man of many talents. He became an ethno ethnocologist, which is a man who studies cultures, especially those outside the Western culture. He became a linguist, who is one who speaks and studies many languages. He is a musician, which is pretty self-explanatory. He is a composer, and he started off in large ensembles and great works, but switched his focus to children's tunes, nursery rhymes, and sight-reading exercise books. But most importantly, throughout all that, we are here to discuss his teaching ideology and methodology. Moving on to his motivation, as he was teaching, he quickly realized that his students at the List Academy were musically illiterate. This drove him to create his own approach to teaching students music. He chose a socioculturistic one. In other words, he started using nursery rhymes and songs that were important to cultures. This way, students were both learning music and becoming more culturally aware of not only their own, but many other cultures as well. He also believed that music is food for the spirit. This, that is an, an essential part of any child's life and education. I am furthering his belief into the idea that teaching music through music education is like working in a soup kitchen. But rather than feeding the poor soup, we're feeding students music. Next, we will go over the key components in this section. Uh, and he has three key concepts and that Kodai pushed in his educational theory. Starting with tone naming. When Kodai is teaching music, specifically pitch or tone, <clears throat> he believes that the classic solfege is the way to go. So, in the key of C major, from C to C, we would use the following symbols. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, and of course, Do. Uh, he also believes in movable Do, which is the idea that each key has its own tonic and its own Do, per se. For example, in the following key, the key of F major with one flat, the tonic is F. But, if I were to take away a flat, and add two sharps instead, the key would change, and therefore the tonic would change as well, and the new Do would become D, and that is why it's called D major. Moving on to rhythmic syllables, when teaching students how to count rhythm, Kodai pushes the idea that there are no counts when starting students out, but rather than counting syllables, he uses syllables that are completely dependent on the note value themselves. For example, a quarter note will always be counted ta, as such. Therefore, a measure of full quarter notes would sound like this. Ta, 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 ta. Going down the subdivision ladder, he counts eighth notes as T. So four beats of continuous eighth notes would sound like this. T, 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 T. And the last subdivision he presses this method on before his students evolve into actually learning to count are sixteenth notes. Sixteenth notes are counted as such. T, B, T, B. So one full measure of sixteenth notes would be T, B, 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 T, B. But don't get used to seeing the notes like this. Kodai doesn't write rhythms and note heads like we've seen them in Western music today. Therefore, we move on to his rhythmic notation. He uses a different kind of notating called stick notation. In this methodology, the note heads are removed from the notes and instead are just focused on beams and stems of notes. So therefore, this single line, representing a quarter note, would be still counted as ta. Two beamed notes that are representing eighth notes in this case will still be counted tt. And of course, double beamed notes are 16th notes and should be counted TBTB. Moving on next is a melodic content focus. The next section of the PowerPoint will cover what content is covered in different Kodai methods and how it is taught to these students. 
Kodai is a strong culturist and believes that the best way to teach music to kids is through music that they have a strong affinity to or are already familiar with. Things like nursery rhymes and culturistic music work works best with young students. A famous quote from Kodai is that masterpieces should lead to masterpieces. He thinks that music should not be dumbed down for children, but the difference between simplifying and dumbing down music is imperative for Kodai. This way, children are not only taught music and taught the masterpieces of music, but taught the importance of music and culture as well. Kodai has five main steps when teaching melodic content or any musical content at all. I have compared these five steps to a stoplight because of how much activity the children are doing while learning. The first two steps are red light learning as in they are not being active other than listening and thinking. You start by preparing a phase or concept through listening or showing the students what they are going to learn. Then you create an environment of conscious learning in the kids, explaining and exploring what the concept is that you are going to teach to them. After this, we move on to the yellow light learning period, which is reinforcing and practicing the concept or phrase being taught. There are differences between reinforcing and practicing. Reinforcing, which is writing and being able to read the concept either standalone or in a musical context, is more reinforcing. Practicing is, of course, practicing the concept on their own. And after enough practice, the students will move from the yellow light learning into the green light learning, where they have their own right to create and perform the music. After this, we go on to the student assessment portion after Kodai has taught all of his students. The last section is learning is how he assesses them. He does more in a group versus individual concepts, and his assessment is less paper and pen and more quality of learning. As stated before, Kodai is a strong believer that music is the food for the spirit, so it makes sense that his assessment is based on spiritual ability as well. He does not think that the quantity of knowledge is a good measure of students' growth, but rather the quality of the learning itself and if the student is able to really take that music to elevate their life. He has been quoted to say that teaching music is effective to the student if the student is able to force to bring the human spirit to life, and through music, he believes that all students should be able to do just that. Following this, we will learn about the Dalcroze method. Hello, this is Freddy Villegas on Dalcroze Eurythmics. Who was Emile Jacques Delcro? He was born in, to a musical family on July 6, 1865. Surrounded by his Swiss parents in Vienna and his sister Helen, his mother Julie was a great teacher and pianist. Her teaching was greatly influenced by Heinrich Pestalozzi, an early advocate for teaching through senses and experiences rather than written word. These philosophies of teaching passed on to her son greatly. They left his childhood full of singing, playing, dancing, and acting. Later in Del Croze's life, while well, when he was about 18, he had attended Geneva Conservatory, not knowing which career he intended to set for himself. The following year, he went to Paris, settling a lifestyle of a passionate actor and musician. It was during this time that he familiarized himself in Mathis Lucy's teachings to recognize problems to approach them, and to devise solutions. He later shifted his interests to music and displaying it by accepting a position as an assistant conductor and chorus master at Theatre de Nouveau in Algier, North Africa. Interestingly enough, this was when he grew facial hair, mostly to negate his youthfulness and to put on a stronger posture towards his students. He also added his last name, Del Crows, at this time, for it had not been there before, and he added it there just so that he would not be confused with a composer sharing his exact name. In 1892, Del Crows returned to Geneva Conservatory to fulfill the role of Professor of Solfege. Through his studies, he learned that his students became very proficient technical musicians, but he worried that they could not hear or feel fear, feel the discrepancies that they were required to perform in music. With this, he quickly combined solfege with rhythmic movement to show the students that the body is ultimately the first instrument of expression. Now, his schooling and professions. Paris! Um... Well, before Paris, his um, his immediate 
first teachings were from his mother, Julie, in Vienna, which were, as I stated before, greatly influ influenced by Pestalozzi. And this will be, um, this will be repeated throughout his life plenty of times, and um, ultimately is what influences uh, Eurythmics, or the Dalcro method. Uh, Paris was where his career had begun as a passionate actor and music composer. It is also where he became familiar with Mathis Lucy's, Lucy's teachings, as I stated before. And then in North Africa, um, this is where he became um, assistant conductor and chorus master. One of his first professions. And uh, rightfully so. He matured a lot. Um, and he showed it a lot in his physical appearance with his beard. That's a picture of Paris right here. And a picture of the modern streets of Vienna. Now, his motivation um, for producing the Del Crow's method was greatly influenced by Pestalozzi. <laughs> Um, the teachers that Dal Crows encountered in his lifetime became mentors and shaped his approach that he later developed into his own method. Now, Pestalozzi was a big influence and shared a lot of the same philosophies as Del Crows, which is why it's, this will be the major influence for him. Um, that's not to say that Bruckner and Lucy were not important figures in his life. Um, Bruckner is seen as almost the counter character of Del Crows. He couldn't stand his intolerance for things and um, the preciseness everything had to be. But he understood its importance. And Lucy sparked his teacher inside him. The him having to recognize problems, approach them, and ultimately find a solution. Here's a picture of Pestalozzi and one of Lucy on the bottom. Now the key components to the Dow Crows method um, are comprised of three things. Rhythmic solfege, or ear training, improvisation, and eurythmic itself. Del Crow's, uh, beginning with rhythmic solfege, Del Crow's always believed that musical students required the skill of being able to write what they hear and hear what they write. Um, solfege is taught in the fixed do approach based on the French approach. Now what makes rhythmic solfege unique is that solfege is always combined with movement, both locomotor and not locomotor. Now for improvisation, improvisational skills are learned sequentially and can be used in many settings. For example, the teacher or the instructor can accompany the student while they improvise movement, character, or react spontaneously to verbal instruction. On the other hand, a student may accompany another with a drum or some sort of musical phrase, while the other improvises movement and vice versa. Known as temps purdue, this will help students to respond accordingly to music and bring out character and expression in their performing. Now for Eurythmics itself. Regardless that it is known as the third component, it is not more important than the other three. Um, Eurythmics is as important as the other two components. Um, there are two ideas ideas of Del Croce's philosophy that support Eurythmics. First, human beings can experience symmetry and balance in music through their own bodies and movement. Second, these three components are interdependent and must be taught together. And we have a picture of um, some students doing the Del Croce method with some scarves and uh, solfege right here. This slide right here is just a sequence of the embodiment, hearing to moving, moving to feeling, 
feeling to sensing and etc all the way from improvising to performance the development of rhythmic sequence um, there are three lessons to this a beginning intermediate and last one known as palestique for a beginning Dow Crow's lesson the students will begin slowly by just walking they will walk to an accompany of improvised music through the music the person accompanying them may speed up or slow down to have the students always adjusting the amount of movement and energy they need to move with this is very guided lesson um, it's very basic not too um, independent yet but once they get to the intermediate lessons the students will begin to explore more difficult subject areas such as polymeters polyrhythms canon tension relaxation breathing etc all these classes will be in a group setting mostly and creativity will be necessary for the movement and improvisation will become much more prevalent as the students become more independent finally pal plastique anime can be achieved which is the performance in a eurythmics class this would be either performed in groups or solo and is completely spontaneous creation of movement that fits the accompanying music thank you so much this was the Dow Crows methods and now moving on to Gordon Edwin Gordon approaches to music education and young children Edwin E. Gordon was born September 14, 1927 and passed away on December 4, 2015 a little bit on his background, he received his bachelor's and master's degrees in string brace from the Eastman School of Music. He received his PhD at the University of Iowa in the year 1958. Gordon was the Carl E. Seashore Professor of Research in Music Education at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There, he researched a plethora of music theory ideas, mostly in young children. The more known topics that he researched were musical aptitude in young children, music learning theory, and the development of music learning. Beginning in 1997, he became the Distinguished Professor in Residence at the University of South Carolina. Here at the University of South Carolina in the Thomas Cooper Library, the Edwin E. Archives house all of Gordon's publications, journals, manuscripts, video and audio cassette recordings from workshops and seminars, as well as some of his personal items including diplomas, honors, awards, and more. In the mid-1950s, Gordon established a set of ideas about how humans learn music through audiation by researching and developing music learning theory. He believes that each human has a potential for music starting at birth. Distributed among the human population, there's a wide variety of music aptitude. Everyone is different, yet everyone has the ability to achieve in music. Music achievement and music aptitude are very different, but have to do with the same thing. Everyone has music aptitude, however, music achievement is only found when the person realizes their level of music aptitude. As a young child, music aptitude and audiation are developed and fluctuating and pretty stabilized after about age 10. For the music classroom, Gordon, on behalf of music education, has worked very hard to establish the foundation of the sequence of development of music, of music learning, especially for young children. Gordon believes that the early years of life are crucial for establishing a foundation for lifelong music development. Children must be exposed from birth to age five in order to be ready for formal music learning later on. Learning how to speak is essentially the same as learning music. As a child, we pick up on our parents talking and begin to babble or try to speak the words we hear and form sentences. We do the same thing with music. We try to hear it and imitate it through singing, but at first it sounds like a, b a babble. This is unstructured, informal learning. Eventually, once the child starts kindergarten around age five, they will receive structured formal learning from their music teacher.
While in music class, the teacher should be teaching the children new and unfamiliar music concepts through singing, chanting, dancing, and moving. These are all ways that the child will understand the new concept. They are taught new things through a learning sequence, which is essentially small steps towards a bigger goal. There are seven stages to preparatory audiation from children's age, children ages 2 to 6. Between ages 2 and 4, they will go through absorption, random response, and purposeful response. These children will hear and collect music through absorption and with random response give a response back without it relating to the music. Then eventually give a response that relates to the music and sound of the environment. Between the ages of 3 and 5, children will be shedding egocentricity, which means they are realizing the babbling is not what the sound of music really is. They will also go through the breaking the code stage, such as learning how to actually speak by beginning to recognize tonal and rhythm pattern patterns. Finally, between the ages of 4 and 6, the children will be able to engage with conscious thought within themselves. They will go through introspection where they will realize there is a lack of coordination between singing and breathing. Then finally, in the last stage of preparatory audiation, they will understand the coordination of singing and chanting with breathing and movement all at once. When the students go to school, they will have a structured, formal learning environment. Gordon has proven that this format helps students learn and grow effectively and achieve in music. As a student, these children will have a structured formal learning environment. In the words of Edwin Gordon, music is unique to humans. Like the other arts, music is as basic as language to human development and existence. Through music, a child gains insights into themselves, into others, and into life itself. Through these four music education theories, all students should be able to learn and grasp music at a young age. They will continue to learn throughout their education and later on in life as adult musicians.